Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our second panel discussion. To, on this um, segment, we're going to be discussing establishing yourself in the field. And we are joined by uh, Dr. O'Reilly and Dr. Rodriguez. And moderating is going to be our very own, very own graduate student, Julie. And I, with that, I'm going to let her take it away to do more of an introduction. Perfect. Thank you for that great introduction, Dr. Ball. And I'm so thankful to be able to be here with all of you to do this panel as well. And so before we start, I want to introduce our two wonderful panel members, Dr. Nancy Rodriguez and Dr. Megan O'Reilly. So Dr. Nancy Rodriguez, she is a licensed clinical psychologist from the Wise Mind Institute. And over the past few years, she has specialized in working with children, adolescents, and families from various backgrounds, especially those who've experienced complex trauma. And she has received specialized training in serving Land X clients as well. So that's great. And Dr. Megan O'Reilly, she is a staff psychologist, lecturer, program coordinator at Stanford's Counseling and Psychological Services. And she also co-founded and is the CEO of Inherent Value Psychologist Inc. It's amazing. And her areas of clinical interest include college mental health, as well as perfectionism, trauma, and multicultural identities. And you could have more information about their bios in the chat, similar to what Roop said. I don't think it did justice to what you two both do to change the world right now. So we're very excited to have both of you talking about how to essentially establish ourselves in the field. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and start. Is that okay? All right. So we have a question from a graduate student, and we're just wondering if both of you can share some suggestions or shed some light on your road to licensure. And we can start with Dr. Rodriguez as well. Sure, thank you, Julie. And mm -hmm. thank you everyone for today. Um, on the road to licensure, when I realized this question, I realized all of the challenges that I had to go through. And it was recently that I was licensed. I've been licensed for just a year now. Um, so it's really recent. and when I was preparing myself to get to that place, I realized all of the challenges that I was having to go through as an immigrant Latina. Mm -hmm. um, there are particular challenges with English being my second language mm -hmm. and having to study, having to learn material for the test that it's very difficult. And as I was doing all of the research for myself to learn the material, I also started to be really curious about what is the likelihood of me passing this huge exam, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was doing that, I realized that it's less likely for me, people of color to pass this exam. And I think just the bias around some of the questions that I was noticing as I was preparing myself, um, because it felt like my cultural lens, I had to put it aside in order for me to actually pass some of those questions. Mm -hmm. um, there were, I just felt like it was very biased, the traditional mm -hmm. sense of psychology psychology, it just, it felt like, again, I had to fit in this one box and mm -hmm. I had to learn to just look at it from this lens. And mm -hmm. it was very limiting for me because as a, you know, my, my culture is very collectivistic and some of the ethical questions were more individualistic. And I was like, well, <laughs> if I were me, if I were consulting with a client, this is what I would do, right? Mm -hmm. But ethically and in the way that it's written in the law, this is what I have to follow. When in reality, like, what does that actually look like? So, so, th so those were some of the challenges that I found as I was preparing myself to take both exams. And on top of that, um, the challenges of how costly the mm -hmm. tests are. So there was mm -hmm. this uh, added um, pressure of how am I going to be able to afford yet another cost? Again, having to realize that, you know, as a student, you're not getting paid just yet. Um, or if you are getting paid through your internship is a very small amount. Um, so those were some of the things that I had to navigate. And I really had to rely on other people who are also going through the same process to just even get their perspective on how they were navigating those challenges. Um, so I just feel like that was that was part of what I was um, having to figure out as I went through through this really heavy process. 
I'm glad you're able to share that insight, just sharing your personal challenges as well as school stressors and financial stressors. Mm -hmm. And just recently, you know, understanding what it's like to be in that one box, like you mentioned, but also noticing what it's like of additional cultural barriers and things like that. It's amazing that you were able to share that. Yeah, thank you. I can piggyback on that a little bit. I can echo some things, but for me, the struggle was, uh, and I've been licensed, what, five years now, so, but I still remember it because it was so impactful. And I think it's important for us to share these stories to light the way, but also empower people that you will get through it, even though it's a really bumpy road. Um, for me, it was two main things. One was just when licensure happens in the kind of the sequence of your education. Uh, for me, it was after internship while I was still on postdoc and life doesn't really slow down even though you have these major exams to take to, to sit for and study for um, there for California, there was these additional classes I had to take, even if I had taken them in my graduate program, California thinks it's special. So there was actually four <laughs> extra classes I had to take while seeing a full client caseload in my postdoc while managing all those other demands. And so it was really hard to carve out enough time to study and actually feel like I was getting ahead. And so that was actually a really stressful time. And for me, this was right after dissertation too. So I was kind of fatigued and a little burnt out of just the writing and the reading. And so I, I was really wrestling with myself because I wanted postdoc to be a little bit of an oasis year and I didn't get that. So for me, there was a lot of internal struggles around. I st I'm not done yet. I still have to grind. And for me, you know, dissertation was this panacea. Once I got through that, I was going to be in the clearing. But realizing that wasn't the case and building up more stamina to keep going was a wrestling. And then, like Dr. Rodriguez said, the financial cost. I really mm -hmm. felt like it was a racket because you these things are required. And mm -hmm. so they get to set the bar of, of the cost and you have to meet it. So really scrapping to get pennies together, because um, again, this was at postdoc, not, not a staff yet, not licensed yet. Mm -hmm. So all the books, all the extra courses, I actually had to source from peers who had done it the year before to get their materials. But I was also at the year where they updated things. Mm -hmm. So I had old books and I had to study with those, but it also made so much anxiety of, am I not studying the most recent stuff? And is that gonna affect my performance on the exam? Mm -hmm. So just a lot of anxiety, which, you know, can, you know, grandfather in depression too, and you know, when it's chronic mm -hmm. enough. So a lot of wrestling, a lot of time management while managing so many other demands. Mm -hmm. And I love when you mention time because as graduate students, what is time? <laughs> and it just keeps on continuing, continuing, and we have to continue to rush ourselves to finish our dissertation, to finish, finish various assignments, in addition to the financial stressors that we all try to deal with as well. And so let's just say, you know, you are licensed, you go into an interview and you get offered that dream job of yours. How do you, or how do you two think can advocate to obtain a fair salary compensation and recognition for your work and previous experiences? And then we could go ahead and start with Dr. Rodriguez as well. Sure. I think this was another area where I felt so unprepared mm -hmm. going into this. It's such a conversation that for me felt like a taboo. Like how mm -hmm. am I ever even gonna ask for what I, what I need when this conversation mm -hmm. wasn't part of graduate school, it wasn't mm -hmm. part of internship, it wasn't part of postdoc. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like, well, what, how do I know how much I deserve, right, mm -hmm. as a psychologist? particularly given that one of the messages that we receive as psychologists is we're mm -hmm. in the helping profession, right? Mm -hmm. So you must do this out of like just the love for helping people. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the conversation, what's left out of the conversation is that we also need to live, right? Like we need to have right. a livelihood. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, again, because also as part of my culture, like you never really talk about money in that way, mm -hmm. right? Like being compensated for what you're bringing to the table. And for me, part of it was also relying on my peers who were going through the same process because I was like, wait a minute, how are you doing it? Because mm -hmm. I don't know, like I feel really intimidating, intimidated even asking for how much they're willing to pay me, let mm -hmm. alone asking for a higher rate. Um, so that was a lot of the conversations that I had to have on the side through mentors, again, some mm -hmm. of my peers, and also doing my own research of like, how do you even ask for more and what is the standard rate? Mm -hmm. um, and I went into like starting to look for jobs. One of my main goals was 
to get comfortable talking about money. And the, and the way that I did that is like, talking to peers again, but also in those conversations, I would do a lot of role like, hey, can you help me figure out, like, what am I asking for? And mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a lot, honestly, a lot of emotional labor that I had mm -hmm. to go through in order to have those conversations and also mm -hmm. realize that as a woman of color, as a mm -hmm. bilingual clinician, I'm bringing so much to the table. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to remind myself because I feel like I was challenging some of the myths and, and beliefs that I had myself of my work not deserving any like mm -hmm. real money compensation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where a lot of the work that I had to do for myself. And then I just mm -hmm. like, I just went for it one day mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm just going to ask for 5% more of what they're telling me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if they say no, that's okay too, mm -hmm. right? And part of the negotiation that I had to do to get the salary that I'm getting right now. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you're able to speak to that and, you know, being a person of color, being a female, and you mentioned how you're bilingual as well. You have a lot to offer. I just want to highlight that too. But as females, you could be uncomfortable at the same time. So I'm, I'm just so happy you're able to be so transparent with your narrative with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, and the only thing I would guess I would add to that, and Dr. Rodriguez, nice work, nice, is um, I actually did get a little coaching. It didn't make it any easier, but uh, it's a few things that I would add is, you know, there's uh, resources online to get mm -hmm. you to allow you to know what the benchmarks are um, mm -hmm. for early career, mid career. And so you can go in with some knowledge of what's the range. And so I can know if I'm getting low balled and I can know what the high ball is and then go in with that spirit of negotiation. No, nope, never take the first offer and give yourself room to come down. So aim high. And so you have room to kind of back and forth. And then the only thing I'm actually really proud that I did was I applied to other places that I pretty much knew I could get in and get an offer. And then I kind of used that as leverage. <laughs> um, and so I was like, this place has offered me this much and this type of sign on bonus. So what can you offer me? And that really did bump it up a little bit. But I just really want to echo Dr. Rodriguez. We bring so much and college mm -hmm. counseling centers, wherever we're going, needs our expertise and who we mm -hmm. are and that wisdom. So we can kind of fold that into the ask. It's part mm -hmm. of what we bring. I think I would add too that something that Dr. Rodriguez pointed out is that we come into this field and people are expecting that we're doing this out of love. Mm -hmm. And that we we simply just care, which may be true. However, you are trained. You are going to school to learn a particular craft. And it's not, I, I want to say, like, in the words of Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? It's really about you being able mm -hmm. to really do your due diligence and practice this craft. And it, too often I hear, you know, this conundrum still happening. We're not getting enough training in graduate schools to discuss money. People are not getting paid in um, practicums and internships and sometimes even postdocs. So it's really hard to establish a sense of value. Um, I would also say, ask quickly. I love the benchmark idea, Dr. O'Reilly, that you brought in. And I would also be curious if you could um, speak to the idea of understanding what you need to bring home in order to establish a sense of value because it's not a number you should pull out of the air and be like what are you charging what are you charging but rather if you have bills and loans and things like could you speak a little bit to thinking about that in terms of choosing your your salary or hourly rate if you're in private practice Yes, both are very important. And area of the country differs too. So here with the area, I have really had to crunch those numbers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you gotta look at the biggies. What is my mm -hmm. monthly expenses, rent, uh, daycare if you have it, groceries, um, and be thinking about what number do I have to make uh, in sum for all those to come out and still give me a proportion that's left over for some wiggle room. And so really thinking about your budget in terms of buckets, requirements, mm -hmm um non-monthlies and then and then hopefully some advantageous uh, quality of living type thing so do i have you know my streaming service do i have time money to eat out do i have enough to save a squirrel away for a rainy day uh, tired type stuff you know and so 
I think just doing a quick YouTube search on what those proportions should be is really nice. So you can start doing your math and crunching your numbers. But especially here in the Bay Area, rent is a huge thing. And that's mm -hmm. actually something you can bring in. Uh, to okay. the meeting, you know, given the cost of living in this area, uh, I, I'm thinking about this range is more realistic. And people mm -hmm. will respect that and understand that they can't really pull one over on you. You're not pulling mm -hmm. the sheet over your eyes. Mm -hmm. you know? I wanted yeah, to add something to that, if it's okay. I'm thinking as you're speaking of like the additional labor that we often are asked to do in our jobs, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's in private practice, because I'm in a group practice right now, there's all of those collaterals that sometimes are like, can you just do this one thing for free? When I was also <laughs> working in nonprofits, there was a lot of like, can you just come and translate this? Can you just come and do this right. other thing? And I think those are added costs, that's added labor that we're constantly being asked to do. And it's part of what you also have to take into account when you think about your budget and how much you're asking. Yes. Because when I started, that wasn't part of my equation. That was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's added labor. And mm -hmm. when I started having those conversations and I was like, but wait a minute, it, in 40 hour week, it's really turning into almost like a 50, 60 hour week mm -hmm. that I'm not getting compensated on in that I deserve to get some type of um, compensation back on. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that piece of like the additional mm -hmm. labor that we're often asked to, to perform. Again, as women of color and using all of mm -hmm. our intersecting identities to bring more, more to the table. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. And I definitely resonate when you're saying how sometimes we're asked to to do extra responsibilities and duties that we're not really recognized for, depending mm -hmm. on what setting you're in. So I'm really glad you're able to share that insight, Dr. Rodriguez. And so I actually have a live question from a student here right now. So I'm just gonna read that. And so th they're wondering if you ever feel like with the cost to even get licensed that you are set up for failure. And so if so, how do you overcome that? And we could switch the order and we could go with Dr. O'Reilly first. Yeah, can I get clarification on the question? The cost yeah. of the license? Mm -hmm. Right, so um, do you ever feel like with the cost to even get licensed that you mm -hmm. are set up for failure? If so, mm -hmm. how do you overcome that? Oh, great question. Mm -hmm. For me, it really did feel like an extra toll um, and something that I had been striving for for so long that I just had to see it to completion, mm -hmm. but it does take a financial hit. Mm -hmm. I, I want to always push back against the narrative of failure because this is something we have earned along the way. And so how I cope with that hit to the finances, the hit to the time, the hit to the emotional well-being because of all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into it, how I push back against that is, you know, my value is to heal my communities and show up in this way. And so what, what it took for me to get there, it becomes a part of the narrative that I will eventually share to people and be able to resonate with people, especially students as they are navigating major setbacks, especially the COVID cohort right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I filed it away as a wisdom type of experience that books book knowledge couldn't give me that I'll be able to uh, package and help shepherd other people through these type of struggles and setbacks that, you know, that makes the triumph very sweeter. Um, but yeah, I didn't see it as a failure, but I saw it as a very hard mountain to climb that really did give me character and grit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what I would just add to that is mm -hmm. that for me, it was very much the same. Like I saw it as a challenge. I knew that it was going to be the financial cost was going to be one thing and that I really needed to get down on the numbers. You were mm -hmm. talking about crunching down the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And like counting your pennies. That was part of the, the journey. And the other part with the challenges of like learning the material, learning how you were going to, you know, say it back in the test. Um, was really also for me looking at those numbers and using it as strength in those moments where I was doubting myself of saying like this test is really set up for me to feel like I'm failing at this mm -hmm. and I have so much to offer that I know I, I deserve a seat at the table, mm -hmm. right? So that was part of my challenging my own, again, myths and, and that um, narrative of this is not meant for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you were both able to reframe failure to actually overcoming those challenges. That, that was beautifully well said. And so also in addition to another graduate student, I guess challenge is in working in the field of psychology, there are just so many states of systemic oppression 
And these include limiting your creativity, excluding your voices, and also the lack of inclusion, lack thereof. And so how can students manage and advocate for themselves when facing these difficult experiences? And we can start with Dr. Rodriguez. Um, sure. Uh, I just, I, I just want to take a second because I think that's such a huge question. Of course, of um, course. To ask. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm just like, honestly taken aback by it because I feel mm -hmm. like that was part of my, my journey throughout, mm -hmm. right, of looking at how much I had to deal with the underrepresentation um, in, in how much I, going back to some of those messages, right, that I felt like I didn't des deserve to be there, mm -hmm. um, thinking about my identity and thinking about, again, I'm not, I'm not seeing myself represented here. Um, and I think part of it for me is like not knowing how to show up sometimes and how I needed to create those spaces. So I think that's kind of like my first initial thought as you ask this question. Um, but I, yeah, I'm just honestly thinking about so many different things that I was having to put up with. I have some thoughts as well, because this deeply resonates with me. But where I work now, Stanford University, the, ca the counseling center, right before I came on as a postdoc, they had a mass exodus of black staff. Three mm -hmm. to four black staff all left. And it was really interesting mm -hmm. unpacking the story about that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things I had to deal with was, am I a diversity hire? And did they just hire me because I just lost all their black staff? So I had to work through that. And how I worked through that was, no, I actually have a really a lot to offer. And the community here, the black students need me even more now because there's mm -hmm. even less of us. So that was the first hurdle. The mm -hmm. second hurdle was, you know, I, I really had to learn from other clinicians of color that work doesn't only have to be the place where you get that voice heard and reflected back. There's mm -hmm. community work. Um, some of us start a private practice. You can do multiple things, not only in your work identity. So that can feed you there too. So mm -hmm. if you're meeting a pushback or dead ends in your work identity, keep pushing. Sometimes mm -hmm. systems take a long time to change, but that doesn't mean you have to wait. You can do that that group outside, or you can do that volunteer work, or you can speak somewhere else and connect into other people doing things, um, and even go outside the department that you're in and find mm. those connections where you can have that voice. And what happens is it catches on, they see the utility, and you can bring that back. It's a little frustrating. It's like I've been telling mm. you this already. You had to wait for <laughs> something else to justify it, but right. you know you get that traction and you get to mm. thrive while you're waiting on the system to catch up mm. to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad both of you were able to share insight basically on knowing how to advocate and utilizing our identities, being a person of color, being a female and utilizing that as a strength mm -hmm. to kind of advocate and navigate our way through that. So unfortunately I have a few minutes left. So I actually do want to ask um, another question. So I'd like to ask how, or what are your thoughts on navigating the dissonance of being from a collectivistic culture within a field that often adopts a westernized and individualist approach? A very heavy loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me dive in. There's so many rubs. There's so mm -hmm. many rubs and um, that, that rub can wear us, like wear us down mm -hmm. or it can polish us. And I wanted to mm -hmm. lean into polishing. One of the ways mm -hmm. I see that show up a lot for myself and for the clients that I serve is with self-promotion. Mm -hmm. A lot of times from a collectivist culture, we value harmony. We don't want to stick out. But mm -hmm. especially in academic systems, sometimes we have to promote our work or say, I want to be first author or say, I, I spearheaded this. So there's a way that we can learn how to thread these needles where we can self-promote or stick out a little bit with, uh, with our values of humility and not being braggadocious. And so mm -hmm. finding our own value around that, finding our own language and finding exemplars. There are many mm -hmm. exemplars that do this um, that we can look up to because sometimes we've seen it done so poorly that we shy away completely. Mm -hmm. So it's the answer is never in the extremes. We have to mm -hmm. find our own sweet spot. So mm -hmm. self-promotion is just one way. But it's also, um, I was listening to the first panel of how, what therapy even looks like. I developed a satellite clinic for Black students so they don't have to come into the health center. They can do it right next to their dorm. Um, being courageous in that. And also thinking about how do we um, model our own health 
process, right? Mm -hmm. So there's many, many rubs, and I think we should stay the course and do a lot of deep listening and know that there's many ways to be healthy, kind of decolonize mental health for mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. so we can shepherd our clients and our colleagues through that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I echo everything that you just said, Dr. Hariri. I think that, you know, you said it beautifully. And I think for me throughout graduate school was also like noticing the times when I had a question or I had a thought that was different from what my peers mm. were saying. Mm. Um, and a lot of the time in the beginning, I would just stay quiet. And mm -hmm. I started questioning, like, why am I staying quiet when I know mm -hmm. I have something to say in this conversation, mm -hmm. when I know I'm thinking something different because of my community? And I, for me, it was often like leaning back to those experiences and saying, like, we deserve some space again. Mm -hmm. And we deserve to have these conversations and that I don't have to fit the mold, right? I don't have mm -hmm. to think about it in this particular way mm -hmm. for me to feel like I'm really doing mental health work. Mm -hmm. Mental health can look in so many different ways. And even thinking about like mental illness, right? And always looking at it from a, this deficit model for me was like, well, how can we actually look at the strengths of the client of ourselves mm -hmm. and utilize those um, to promote, again, mental health, right? And mm -hmm. part of it me was even thinking about coming from again a collectivistic culture mm -hmm. thinking about you know like attachment and how it's taught in school that's like mm -hmm. you know you have to individualize from um from your parents you have to do mm -hmm. at your house after 18 and to be completely honest mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. not, you know, like, that's sometimes we you know we're 25 28 and mm -hmm. still at home Mm -hmm. Right. And for me, even right as a graduate student, I was living with my parents. And mm -hmm. a lot of the time I was like, wait, what does this mean about myself? Right. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not, you know, there's nothing wrong with me for mm -hmm. having different ideas and bringing being from a different um, way of growing up. Um, so, again, a lot of it was for me relying on some of my experiences saying like, but wait a minute, that's not true. Right. Mm -hmm. I actually. I can do this and I can share mm. where I come from and where my thinking comes from, that it also deserves some light and it deserves to be shared. So I think that was part of it for me mm. as well. I definitely resonated with both your narratives and kind of from a collectivistic culture myself, I was the quiet one in class. I had a hard time really speaking up. And I was wondering why as well, but then I realized later on that it was okay to just be that voice that's different and to hear mm -hmm. a different perspective. So I really appreciate what you said, Dr. O'Reilly, about never in the extreme mm -hmm. instance of a box and just being that outside person to hear a different perspective. So thank you so much for both of you sharing your insight and experiences that will definitely help us navigate the challenges in the future. And Dr. Ball, I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts on this. I just think that both of you spoke to something that I think doesn't get enough attention is the, mm -hmm. the fact that your individuality brings your creativity to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And we cannot grow as a society, as a country, as a world, if we don't have creativity and hear different perspectives and hear different thoughts. So if you are that graduate student who is being quiet, we definitely want to hear your voice because you never know, you could have a thought that changes the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100 percent yeah <laughs> well we want to thank you guys so much for your time this has been such a wonderful discussion and i can guarantee that there are there are many comments and a lot of thoughts that you guys have percolated in the minds of many so really appreciative of both of you mm -hmm. and june yeah. do you want to add yeah i just want to say thank you again to echo what dr ball is saying it's been a phenomenal experience being able to talk to both of you who has shed so much light either on licensure or being a person of color and the challenges that come with that and that will definitely help those people to find their voice and to advocate in the field once they are licensed trying to find a job as well so thank you so much thank you well everybody thank you you guys have a wonderful evening